Hey everybody, thanks for taking the time out of your day to check this video out. Uh, here at Dark Angel Medical, we are extremely passionate about enriching lives, making people's lives better, uh, putting birthdays in boxes as we say, uh, and we do that through a number of ways. One is education and one is uh, another is by our products. And we're offering this video for free because we feel it's vitally important for those of you out there who may not have medical training or may have had some hesitancy about doing medical training to do this because it's so critically important in these in, in, in our in our world nowadays because you may be your own first responder. You may be the one who puts that tourniquet on. You may be the one who packs that wound. You may be the one who seals that box. And so we talk about this, uh, about these those principles, the tourniquet, the limbs, the path, the junctions, and seal the box in very detailed manner. So uh, go ahead and get your uh, get your notepad out, get your pen, uh, take this seriously because this could this video that you're about to watch could literally be the difference between life and death. So we appreciate you doing this and, and taking the time out of your day to check this video out. And I uh, hope you have a great time. Hope you learn a lot. And just remember, be the difference. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the proper application of a tourniquet on the extremities, on the limbs. Cause we talked about, that's part of the trauma man tips, uh, the tourniquet, the limbs portion of it. So right here, I've got a training cat gen 7 from north american rescue and i've got a training soft t gen 5 from tap med solutions both these are fantastic tourniquets uh one of the, some of the ones we sell these are like the ogs of the tourniquet world i uh, got a lot of data on them a uh, little difference in the uses and we're going to talk about that in just a second but you'll notice both these are in plastic right so um and you'll notice are both blue for dedicated training turn, uh, training tourniquets so what you want to do is make sure real world and your training tourniquets you know obviously you got to take them out of the plastic first but your real world tourniquets get them out of the plastic keep them in a pouch that way they're quickly accessible uh, and you don't have to sit there and fumble around with this shrink wrap or this plastic wrapper on there with slick bloody gloved up hands um, secondarily um, use a dedicated training tourniquet only for your training okay super important on that because uh after a while you will decrease the tensile strength on this nylon which means more turns of the windlass to achieve the stoppage of blood which means they're going to be bleeding a little bit longer so dedicated training tourniquets and get these things out of the, uh, your real world out of the plastic and into your pouch so they're ready to ready to rock and roll so we're going to talk about uh Proper application and improper application. We're going to go over an improper application first and, and demonstrate that for you uh, and where you have to get the slack out because getting the slack out of the tourniquet is probably, I would say, the most crucial step in getting a proper tourniquet applied um, because as I get all the slack out of these straps, either strap, uh, that means it's so tight it's almost causing arterial occlusion, which is our goal. And then that means less turns on this windlass, which means less time that they're bleeding. Uh, that's a, a big, a big takeaway. Also, uh, where do I put it? Uh, if you can readily identify the bleed, we're going to put it on a uh, deliberately placed tourniquet or a deliberate tourniquet application that's two to three inches above the wound, unless there's a joint in the way, in which case I would go above the joint to get the tourniquet applied. If I can't identify it, I'm gonna put on what we call a hasty tourniquet. That's gonna to be our high and tight tourniquet that we talked about for so many years. So uh, high and tight, if you, can, if you can't identify the bleed, that's a hasty application. Deliberate application, if you can't identify the bleed, that's two to three inches above the wound, unless the joint in the way is in the way, and then you go above the joint. So here we go. Two things I need, my gloves and my tourniquet. So I'm gonna go ahead and get my gloves on when I notice the the bleed, because I don't want to get contaminant on me, if at all possible. So I've got my, my gloves in place. Again, this is where it's important to have that tourniquet out of the shrink wrap. And it's also got the instructions right here. So <laughs> kind of a you're kind of late to the game if you are trying to read the instructions while somebody's bleeding. So know how to use those, but that's a good it's a good thing to review once you take your tourniquet out of the wrapper. All right, so got my tourniquet. I've got the bleed going on here. We see the definite, the definite pulsatile flow. So I'm gonna go ahead and get my tourniquet out of the wrapper here. Or out of the setup. And then I can identify this bleed. So I'm gonna get it two to three inches above the wound. Now, improper application. What a lot of people do, or in studies they've shown, they don't get it tight enough. Okay, so now he's bleeding. I think I've got it on, so now I'm going to start spinning my windlass. 
And I've got this tourniquet, I've got this windlass spun all the way around, and he's still bleeding. Because look, I can still get fingers underneath the strap there. That's what you don't want. That is an improper application. Okay, so we're gonna talk about a proper application. Now I've got my cat out of the wrapper uh, and you can see the pulse style flow. Now, as I unroll it, if I can loop it over the arm uh, to, get it, to get it in place, that's cool. If I have to unwrap it all the way, that's cool. In this application, let's just go ahead and lasso the arm. We're gonna go two to three inches above. Now, get all the slack out as much as possible to get this strap down as tight as you can. Now, I'm gonna start spinning my windlass. And after one turn, one full revolution, the bleeding is completely stopped. I'll take my excess strappage here, bring it over the windlass, you can bring it back through if you want to. A lot of people have, you know, a lot of different ways to do it. No wrong way to eat a Reese's here. Let's just get this thing uh, secured down. And uh, then I can get my windlass retention strap over here, over the windlass retention clip. You see that word right there, time, critically important. Look at your, look at your timekeeping device. Notice what time it is. Take out your Sharpie and write your information in there on my windlass retention strap. And that's for first responders so that uh, the hospital receiving personnel know how long this tourniquet has been in place. All right, so that's a CAD application. One of the cool things about the Soft T is it's got a quick disconnect uh, link here made with, that's with the newer generation is the polymer one. So all I have to do is just un, un, uh, unlink it, unsnap it, loop it around the extremity, snap it back in place, get all the slack out, and to know that you've even got all the slack out, they have this cool little thing called the slack indicator wedge, which is right here. So if I pull all the slack out, that wedge disappears, uh, which means I've got as much tension on this tourniquet as I can before I start spinning my windlass, put it through the windlass guide, and then the windlass retention clip goes up over this little notch here to secure it in place. Now where I need to mark my time is gonna be at the very bottom of this tourniquet here, where it clearly is marked time in this little block right here. So and that's right above, uh, right below the lot number for this tourniquet here. So let's get going on a uh, soft T application. So I see my bleed, I've got my tourniquet out of the wrapper. I've got the arterial flow. I'm gonna go ahead and unsnap it. Roll this thing around under here. Get my link, you hear it click in place. Get all my slack out and then start spinning my windlass. And you see it right there. One turn is all she wrote. And then I would take my handy dandy marker here and write my time on my tourniquet strap here. And that's it for the soft T application. All right, we tourniqueted the limb and showed you how to do a proper tourniquet application. Now we're gonna move on down the trauma man card here to packing the junctions. And you see here on the diagram, we've got it laid out what your junctions are. Uh, down here on the mannequin, you see base of the neck, uh, the armpits, also known as the axillary region, and then the groin, also called the inguinal region. Why we are packing these areas with a hemostatic gauze is because I can't tourniquet that off. Uh, so I've got to achieve bleeding control in these areas with high, uh, with, uh, high arterial uh, vasculature uh, concentration in that area, whatever you want to say, but you got art, big arteries in these areas and we got to get them packed off and get the bleeding stopped. And what a hemostatic gauze does is it helps create a clot faster than it would uh, be created uh, naturally in our body. Also for losing clotting factors, uh, you need to get uh, through the hemorrhage, you need to get the bleeding stopped as quickly as possible. All right, so the we're using the quick clot combat gauze training gauze. It's got the, it's the blue packet, kind of like the blue tourniquets, uh, trainer tourniquets that we use. And the goal with this is to get compression down in the wound and that helps slow the bleeding, which enables the hemostatic to work, which creates 
coagulation. So compression leads to coagulation. Once we get this gauze in there, we have to hold it. We have to first identify the bleed, pack the gauze to the source of the bleed, and then we have to make sure we hold it there for the time recommended by the manufacturer, which is two to three minutes. And once we ascertain that there's no bleeding, then we can use a, any standard pressure best dressing bandage out there to reinforce this 12 feet of loose gauze down that wound because we're counting on that clot to be very stable. And the areas that we have the clot built up, the base of the neck, the armpits, the groin, that's where everything attaches to our torso and that can have a lot of movement. So we got to keep that clot nice and stable. Now, if this, uh, if this sucker gets saturated and you have an additional roll of the quick clot, then pull this one out and put a fresh roll in because all the hemostatic has been expended from this one. So that one's no good, so we had to uh, take that out, pack a new one in. Now, if you don't have uh, um, an additional roll of quick clot uh, combat gauze, rather hemostatic gauze, then you need to pack in more material behind it if you can, and if not, you're gonna have to hold pressure for at least 30 minutes on that arterial uh, area to hopefully get that clot built up. So that's the basics of wound packing. Let's get down into it and uh, and uh, demonstrate how it's done. Okay, so we can see the bleeding. I need to get my hemostatic out. This is the area I can't uh, tourniquet off. I'm gonna get my quick clot here. I'm gonna take out a section and create what we call is the power ball to get that hemostatic delivered to the wound, down to the source of the bleed. I'm gonna hold pressure. As I'm holding pressure, I need to go ahead and get my next feed to my finger hold, only take it out enough time to get it down in there. Keep holding that good steady pressure. We get out my next pack. Keep holding. Bring the pack to my finger. And around this time, hopefully, you should start seeing some stoppage of bleeding. Get that in there. Notice I'm doing this a little slow and deliberately to show you how I'm getting it there. I'm just bringing the next pack to my finger that's holding pressure and then push that new feed down into the wound right there. You can actually see that right there. Keep doing that. Hold that pressure. Only lift that finger long enough to get that next pack down in there. Our goal is to get this whole roll of gauze, gauze packed down in here. And if that finger gets tired, well, switch over and you can use your thumb. Continue to hold that good pressure, only lifting that finger to get that next pack down in there. All right, now, I've got all 12 feet of gauze in that wound. I'm gonna hold pressure for two to three minutes. Make sure my gauze is not saturated through. It's not saturated through right there. I'm gonna check around my edges. Once it's been three minutes and I've held that pressure, no saturation, I've got the bleeding controlled in this area here. I'm gonna take my standard pressure bandage in this case, this is a, one of our training izzies, our emergency bandages. And I will go ahead and get this applied. Put the, wound, put the pad over the wound where that pressure bar is gonna come in contact with it. And I'll have to go underneath the casualty's leg. Try to get up a little high with so that I can get a good angle this way so I can get good pressure down over the wound. So I'm gonna pull real tight. I'm gonna pull real snug, real tight on that. 
so that I can get this going, go through the pressure bar. And when I go through the pressure bar, just like with any standard pressure dressing application, I'm gonna go through the pressure bar and then I'm going to bring it back like that, trying to get as much material over that pressure bar as possible to get that pressure bar kicked up over the wound. So I'm actually putting pressure down over the wound that I just packed to help hold that gauze in place. Hold it in place, get a nice snug pull, go over the pressure bar again, and you're gonna keep wrapping this sucker until you have it locked down. Now, a little trick, if you're using a hemostatic gauze and you have the empty package here, and let's say it's the, the bleeding control dressing, the white package of bleeding control dressing, what we sell in our civilian level kits, um, it does not have an x-ray visible strip in there. So what you can do is like say, this is gonna be probably the last wrap. I will go ahead and take the empty wrapper, place it underneath that pressure bandage fold on that last wrap, and then secure the bandage in place using these hooks here, so that whenever the patient gets to the hospital, they know that they have a hemostatic dressing in the wound. Just something as simple as that. Keep that dressing or keep that, uh, that packaging underneath the bandage there. So now it's time to seal the box. We've already done uh, tourniqueting the limbs. We've already done uh, packing the junctions. And now it's time to seal the box. What we're talking about on this little mannequin right here is uh, the area from collarbone down to, down to about belly button. We call this the box. This is your thoracic area right in here where your lungs and your heart and great vessels are all located. And so we're gonna be applying one of these hyphen uh, trainer chest seals to the defect to show you how we would apply it, how we how we put it on while we're doing this. Uh, the big thing with chest seals is I'm creating an artificial barrier uh, because there is now a defect in this chest wall and air pressure outside the chest wall is positive pressure. Air inside where the lungs live is negative, that the lungs are inflated through negative pressure. So if the that pressure is negative in here, positive out here, air is going to continue to get pulled in here, causing more problems, more pressure, especially if it's not venting um, and pushing over and causing what we call a tension pneumothorax instead of what this is called a simple pneumothorax or an open pneumothorax. Uh, so we want to put this vented chest seal on. Now, if this, if this uh, wound does happen to vent, that's great because the, the any kind of positive pressure buildup inside the chest cavity will exit out the vent channels on the chest seals, or if you're using a halo chest seal, uh, it'll, it'll vent out of that big hole in the four slits on the, uh, on the, the chest seal, the halo chest seal. Um, but our goal is to slow uh, the development of that problem inside the chest. Big thing with this is if I have a wound on the front, I need to check for a wound on the back. If there's one, then I need to you do the same, same exact application process. Uh, again, these are just informational videos for a lot more in-depth information. Come take one of our in-person classes or take one of our online classes. So let's get to it. Okay, so I've noticed the defect in the chest. I've got my gloves on. I am going to uh, pull up uh, their shirt to see what's going on. Uh, if there's any dry material, I can use this to wipe the blood away and then I can use my gloved hand to apply occlusion over the wound, get my chest seal opened up. And you'll notice when I get the chest seal opened up, there's a piece of gauze in here, uh, which if you don't have any dry clothing or anything, you can use this piece of gauze to 
wipe any blood away because the hydrogel material that these chest seals are made of stick better to drier skin. They won't slide around. So uh, you'll notice here I've got three channels and I've got this big hole in the middle. This is where this is what you're going to put over the defect right here where my fingertip is. I'm going to put this over the defect, the hole in the chest, and then hopefully if there's any positive pressure build up, if it vents, uh, then it will vent through these channels here. So I'll pull this tab while I'm keeping this vented. And then I will tell the patient if they're conscious, take a deep breath. As I take a deep breath, then I'll say, okay, I need you to go ahead and exhale. As I exhale at the peak of exhalation, uh, I am gonna seal this down. And then you'll see the three channels right here. Make sure you don't get the clothing caught in there like I just did. You got one, two, three channels for that to vent out of. Make sure you got it sealed up as, as well as possible. Now, I've got this wound here on the front. I also need to look at the back for any other wounds. Make sure there's nothing back here, any defects, no bleeding, anything like that, which we will also have accomplished during our um, initial blood sweep when we're checking for massive life-threatening hemorrhage as this falls into the, the breathing phase of our algorithm. So that is the application of a chest seal. And we want to make sure that uh, we keep checking the patient, get the patient down on their affected side, the bad side down, good side up uh, to help them with breathing. If they're not able to sit upright, otherwise let them sit in whatever position is comfortable to them and get rapid uh, treatment at a uh, rapid transport to a definitive care facility. So, um, so tourniquet limbs, pathojunctions, seal the box. Okay, so exposing my patient using a pair of trauma shears, these are the rip shears. Why I want to expose my patient uh, is to check for further injuries. Also, if the clothing is contaminated, wet, anything like that, I need to get that off of them. And But make sure that if you do take clothing off of someone, uh, you get them covered up, not only for modesty's sake, but also for uh, hypothermia control to keep that body temperature as warm as possible. Uh, on a shirt, we're gonna, we're gonna use these rip shears designed by my my buddy, good buddy Smitty and Freeze at Rip Shears. And so uh, these are a lot faster because they have this little thing right here. It's like a, it looks like a seat belt cutter. It's a couple of little sharp razor blades. Uh, and uh, the, basically with their, their premises, they're saying is snip and rip. So it's a pretty simplistic process. Like if I was just cutting a shirt off, you know, this, this takes a while, right? So there's some areas you can look at on shirts um, where the seams are under the arms, uh, under the armpit, like right here. And then like on legs, on pants, you can look down where the seams are on the inside of the legs here. And these are great areas. So what we're gonna try to do is just minimize our, our number of cuts on here. So I'd snip up at the top of the shirt, flip them around and use a ripper and come down to the armpit. And then all I gotta do is hit that seam in the armpit and then hit the seam down here on the shirt and now I've got the whole shirt opened up so I can see the chest. Now if this is if this is dry material and I can use it to keep them covered and keep them warm then perfect then we can just cover them back up with that and we're not uh, we're not just tossing it away or destroy, destroying it all together you know well we are destroying it but we're not uh, just bending it over here. Now on the pants, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a cut up at the top, going down towards the, the inguinal crease here, the groin, and uh, cut up here, going down. Uh, I'll snip it, rip it down here, snip it, rip it down here to the seams. And then if I can keep on going, I'll snip uh, or I'll rip all the way down. Now these pants are reinforced right here in the crotch. So what I may have to do is take a snip down here and pull back up. So Let's just do that real quick. So I'm gonna snip, get my snip started. Then I'll take my ripper, hold down here, and I've already gotten it right here, so I may be able to go all the way down this leg, down these pants. So let's see what we can do. I've already gotten good, my good rip started. Hold tension on that material, and there you go. Now I can completely disrobe that leg and look at everything there while maintaining some modesty, keeping that growing covered uh, until I need to 
access the groin to see if there's any kind of injuries in this area as well. So what I do is on the other leg, take a snip, do a rip, all the way down, and that's way quicker than old school trauma shears. And now you've got them completely depantsed uh, for your trauma examination. So once you got your casualty treated and you've got all your interventions done, all the bleeding stopped, all the breathing has started, uh, we've got to treat for, for shock, uh, any kind of hemorrhagic shock situation with this patient. Uh, and a vital component of that is keeping them warm. Uh, we use this one mil thick mylar blanket and turn them into what we call the trauma taco because we want to put it underneath them so they don't lose body heat to the ground through conduction and we want to cover them up over their body so they don't lose body heat to the air through convection. It's critically important to keep someone normal thermic or normal body temperature in a type of situation where they've lost a lot of blood because uh, they've lost clotting factors and if they are not warm enough the body does not clot well. Uh, it impairs the clotting capability which leads to more bleeding which unfortunately can lead to death. So get them warmed up, put this blanket underneath them, wrap it around them, and turn them into a trauma taco. Okay, so I've got my one mil thick mylar blanket here. Uh, these are pretty fragile, so make sure whenever you're uh, putting this underneath your casualty, it, you're going to be around where they are. These are a 52 inch by 84 inch blanket for this mannequin here. It will go underneath and around them. However, if someone is too big for that, what you can do is go perpendicular and just make sure that at least the core is protected because that's where all your, your vital organs are. So we're gonna lay this blanket out on the opposite side of my casualty, and then I'm going to make sure that I start tucking it in so that I can get them covered up appropriately. All right, so I'm gonna put the arm up, and then I'll start unrolling this so that a short end is on the opposite side of the casualty. And then when I roll them, into the recovery position, it will be easier for me to unroll down here. Now you can see this is, like I said, 52 by 84. So I'm just making sure I tuck it in as much as I can so that as I roll them, I can then begin to get them covered up. It takes a little bit of time little bit of practice. These things are super lightweight. You're definitely moving your casualty around, but the important thing is getting it tucked under so that I can unroll it and untuck it after I roll them over. Okay, so I think I got that pretty well unrolled so that I can get them on their side. So as you notice, the arm is up on the side. I'm going to be rolling them now this is a mannequin, so this arm is not gonna go over, but you put their arm over their chest and reach up under the base of their skull, grabbing their pants, and I'm gonna gently roll them away from me. And then I'll be able to look at their back. Uh, see any injuries I may not have seen, but I've already got this guy already exposed. I'm gonna put their leg up here to make it kind of like a kickstand. And then you notice, since I rolled them over, everything I tucked in is now ready to bring up and over the casualty to keep them nice and warm. So you notice it's covering their, their core. It would if the arm would go down, but the core is covered. And then that patient is gonna be laying on their side this arm would come up so that I could move them down on the ground like so to make sure that airway is maintained and open. But that is the trauma taco. Hey everybody, thank you so much for taking the time to watch that. We hope you learned a lot. If you have any questions on any of that, uh, shoot us an email to info at darkangelmedical.com and uh, we'll, uh, we'll get back to you as quickly as possible. 
Uh, in addition to this free online training video, we highly advocate you to continue your education uh, either through the, our online training video, and you can click the link right there, or you can click on our training tab on our website and check out and see what the in-person offerings are. And we really, really do advocate that you get an in-person training class because you get those questions answered, you get that hands-on time that's so important, so valuable because medical truly is a perishable skill. So uh, while, you know, check, out our, check out our website and look at the various products we have. We even have the online training bundle that you can, uh, you can get your the products on there so that you can continue to practice this very perishable skill so you can stay sharp and, and be able to react in a situation defect decisively and effectively. Uh, uh, the products that we carry, we put it in our kits for a reason. If uh, and, and we have many different kits for many different different types of situations, and we recommend you take a look at them, see which one fits the situation you're going to maybe find yourself in or your requirements that you need one for. If you're going to build your own kit, or as we say, if you're going to roll your own, um, make sure you look at the the products we have in our kit and try to mirror that because you want the best products for the worst situation and you want to have good results. Uh, that's going to come from one, the products, but also two, the knowledge and how and when and where to use them. And that's going to come from this education that you get and continually practicing with them. If you haven't seen, if you haven't had an in-person class, you want to come to one of the classes, check out the training tab. If we're not going to be in your area, but you'd like to host a class, we're open to that too. So send us an email to that info at darkangelmedical.com about hosting the class and we'll get back to you. So once again, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to watch this video. We hope you got a lot out of it. And just remember, go out there, get a kit, get trained, and be the difference. Y'all stay safe.